with John Chancellor at the Kennedy Space Center, Roger Mudd in New York, and tonight's special segment, The Long Road to the Space Shuttle. Good evening. The weather is perfect. The spaceship is ready. The astronauts are asleep. The officials here are happy, and it looks as though the space shuttle will take off tomorrow. The countdown is proceeding smoothly, and the shuttle Columbia, the most complex vehicle of any kind ever built, seems to have put behind it the troubles which have plagued this project. The astronauts, John W. Young and Robert L. Crippen, did some flying today. In a specially equipped executive jet, they flew over the Kennedy Space Center, familiarizing themselves with the runway. If there is trouble immediately after tomorrow's scheduled launch, the astronauts will have to turn the shuttle around and land here, a dangerous business. Today, just in case, they practiced. As the flight directors continued the countdown and launch control, the people in charge of things here were a confident bunch today. Uh, the whole launch team feels uh, real good about the uh, operation where we stand now, and I share uh, Mr. Yardley's opinion. I think we're going to make it tomorrow, too. The crew's health is excellent, and they couldn't be more ready for the flight. Weather tomorrow should be very much like today, excellent for STS-1. There is a possibility of some low fog early in the morning. It should dissipate right after scheduled launch time. It should be so low that it is not to interfere with the uh, scheduled mission time. Perhaps a million people will be in this vicinity tomorrow here at Cape Canaveral for the launch of the space shuttle. If all goes well, there is no sign that it won't. It will be a piece of important history, a reusable spaceship, the beginning of an age in which trips into the vacuum of space will be routine. Our science correspondent, Robert Bazell, is here at the Cape, and he has this report on the mission. The shuttle itself is about the size of a DC-9 jet and weighs four and a half million pounds. But as you can see here on the launch pad, it's attached to a huge tank for liquid fuel and two solid fuel booster rockets. This will be the first time astronauts will ride into space in a craft which has not had an unmanned test. The shuttle will shoot up from its launching pad much faster than the spaceships used on previous manned missions. Two minutes and 12 seconds after the launch, 28 miles above the Earth, the two solid fuel booster rockets will be jettisoned. The rockets will parachute into the ocean off Florida, where NASA hopes to retrieve them. Even though the launch is fast, the shuttle will take longer to get into orbit than previous spaceships. The reason is that eight and a half minutes after the launch, the spacecraft flying upside down in a gravity-free environment will let go of its huge external tank, which contain liquid fuel, before it goes into orbit. NASA officials hope that this maneuver will permit them to predict where pieces of the tank will fall, so they can avoid a repetition of the return of Skylab. With Skylab, they didn't know where the pieces would fall. The hope is that the tank fragments will fall in this area off the Indian Ocean. Next, the two small rockets at the rear of the craft, called the Orbital Maneuvering System, will be fired to push the vehicle into orbit. Here is the path of the craft on the first trip around the Earth. As soon as it gets into orbit, the astronauts will open the huge doors covering the cargo bay. On future missions, the cargo bay will carry scientific experiments or satellites for launching. But this trip, there is only a small package of instruments to measure the ship's performance in flight. When the doors are open, we should get our first TV pictures from the shuttle, shots of the Earth. Tomorrow afternoon and evening, we'll get two more TV shows, pictures of the astronauts on the flight deck and in the crew quarters. On the second day, the astronauts will continue checking the instruments, which measure the shuttle's performance. On the morning of the third day, the astronauts will flip the craft around, then fire the two maneuvering rockets. This will slow the shuttle down enough so that it will fall out of orbit and begin plunging toward Earth. As it re-enters the atmosphere, the orbiter will heat up to temperatures as high as 2300 degrees Fahrenheit. This heat is supposed to be absorbed by the protective tiles covering Columbia, which have been so troublesome. Then one of the most difficult parts of the mission, bringing the ship back to Earth. The craft will have no power. It will be a glider falling quickly and the astronauts will have to maneuver it to a precise landing. There are uncertainties in the first flight of any spacecraft, and they can never be resolved until the first mission is over. John? Somebody said that up until now, the American space program has been like an airline which threw away its planes after one flight. That's what happened in the Mercury and Apollo programs when the space capsules landed in the sea. 
If the shuttle works, it will land on the ground again and again and again. We'll have more on the shuttle later in the program. Roger Mudd will have the rest of the news after this. It's been almost six years since the last American journeyed into space. During that time, the United States did some spectacular and useful work in space with unmanned probes to Mars, Saturn, Venus, and the dark regions beyond. But also in the last six years, the Soviets have had an active program in which 43 cosmonauts have journeyed into orbit. Now the United States is about to return to manned flight, and if the shuttle works, return in a big way. There are those who are asking if this $9 billion program is worth it, however, and that's the subject of this special segment prepared by John Dance. The Apollo moon landing program was a spectacular success for NASA. As it wound down in 1972, NASA was looking for a new, highly visible manned spaceflight program to maintain its glamour image. That's the theory of Dr. John Logsdon, a George Washington University political science professor who has written extensively on the space program for the last dozen years. NASA got used to the luxury of the extra money, the public attention, the uh, importance to the general public that came with Apollo and the excitement and the challenge and wanted to do it again. Skylab came after Apollo, but basically just used leftover Apollo parts. The new vehicle chosen to succeed Apollo was a reusable space shuttle. It stands at last on the launching pad, behind schedule and over budget. It could open a new era in space travel, or it could be a huge white elephant. The space shuttle was a compromise from the beginning. NASA first wanted a fully reusable shuttle, one that would take off and land like a conventional plane. But that would be very expensive, and nobody in NASA thought Congress would buy it. So the agency settled on a cheaper design, a shuttle that takes off like a rocket, lands like a plane, and can be used again and again. Furthermore, NASA said it would cost only $5.1 billion, cheap for a new spacecraft, too cheap, as it turned out. John Yardley, NASA's manager of the space shuttle, now admits it. We did not have a national commitment uh, spurred on by the president uh, so it was a, a tough sell. Now, in that kind of environment, uh, uh, people sharpen their pencils and perhaps over-sharpen their pencils, not necessarily knowingly. But one tends to be optimistic, and in retrospect, you'd have to say that was the case. Critics say NASA's optimism amounted to a deliberate distortion of the budget figures in an attempt to get Congress enmeshed in the program, a technique known in Washington as buying in. What NASA did, really, was to... Uh, tell us that the uh, cost would be less than I think they knew it would cost, and that they could deliver it more quickly than they did. NASA's optimistic budget quickly began to pinch. The engines for the space shuttle were radically new. When problems developed, there was no money for extensive testing or trying alternative solutions. Testing had to be put off or stretched out. The engine program quickly fell behind schedule. Then there were the tiles made of brittle slabs of silica fiber intended to make the insulation on the shuttle reusable, which it was not on Apollo. Each tile was a different size and thickness, glued to the shuttle's thin metal skin. But no one had reckoned with what would happen when the shuttle's thin skin began flexing from aerodynamic pressure. George Jeffs, shuttle manager for Rockwell International. If you're flying on a commercial airplane, it's uh, common to look out at the wing and see the top skin all buckled. It's designed that way. You can't stand that in the orbiter. In order if you did that, you'd induce loads into the tiles that crack the tile. It was not until Congress relented and gave NASA more money that the problems began to be solved. Now, engineers say the shuttle is ready, but it's three years behind schedule and nearly 30% over budget. Counting inflation, that's almost $10 billion. One reason Congress bought the space shuttle was that it was to be cheaper, more flexible, and versatile than the present generation of expendable rockets. But some things first envisioned for the shuttle are just not practical. It can repair some satellites, but many important ones are beyond its reach. Their orbit is much higher than the shuttle's. Industry has been slow to book space on the shuttle, even though the microgravity of space may make possible new alloys, pharmaceuticals, and electronics crystals. Few industries seem willing to commit the money necessary to develop the processes. John Logston says the shuttle could turn out to be a classic mistake. It's a pretty good space truck for taking things up and down, but for doing anything once you're in orbit, say it's, it's a very inflexible and underpowered vehicle. The shuttle is the most complex space vehicle man has ever built. It is a result of nine years of compromise, negotiation, and cost overruns. Soon, we'll begin to find out if it was all worth it. 
John Dancing, NBC News.